Hi everyone, it's so lovely seeing you all here. Um, hope you had a restful morning and um, we just enjoyed a really fantastic panel um, by a group of young people activists and a wonderful Providence teacher um, and I know that it left me um, with a lot of deep thoughts and also feeling inspired and mobilized by your words. So thank you so much for sharing so openly and honestly um, and sharing your time with us. That was fantastic. Um, my name is Sophie. I am graduating on Saturday, um, yeah. but yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> um, so I guess this is the last time I will introduce myself as an undergrad at Brown, um, but I've had the privilege of working with the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice for the past three years and with the Carceral State Reading Group, um, which Felicia will introduce in a moment um, for a bit over a year now and with Professor James for about six months. So um, I'll quickly let them introduce themselves or I'll say my thing and then they'll introduce themselves. Part of our, we do things a little informally and conversationally, so um, I welcome you to invoid, in, join in that, um, that atmosphere. So as I mentioned, um, I had the joy and privilege of meeting Professor James last April when she came to Providence for um, a big public event with the Carceral State Reading Group. And it was such a special day because she gave so fully to the group um, having a workshop with the group and then a beautiful public event, um, but not just bringing her all for those more formal parts of the day, but in conversation, walking from one meeting to the next or at the dinner all together. Um, she just really embodies an honesty and an openness that I think is all too rare in the academy and um, is really important in the way that Professor James reflects critically about the university and her place in it. Um, I noticed from our short time together um, how she really listens to people's questions, not just responding with a rote answer, but really pausing um, and thinking in a way that has inspired me since our time together um, to try to do the same. Um, and in addition, since we met in April, um, she has done such an incredible job sending emails throughout the year with updates on the work that Professor James is doing, but also really making an a concerted effort to connect myself and the other folks who were in the Carceral State Reading Group last year with other activists and scholars and scholar activists and folks around the country um, who are engaging in similar abolitionist projects or trying to think with an abolitionist lens. Um, and for me, that is so important because um, we, there's so much amazing work going on and I feel like all too often the academy is a silo that doesn't think and work to connect. Um, so I really appreciate um, the way that she engages in those ways. Um, so it is not just because of her scholarship, which is also incredible, but because of the way that she goes about that scholarship with such intention um, that we were so excited to have Professor James join us again um, today and tomorrow um, for a workshop with the reading group and some other activists that she so generously offered to facilitate. Um, and lastly, before I turn it over to Felicia, who will share a bit more about um, the reading group, I wanted to thank Professor James because even in the past 24 hours, she's asked us all like what we wanted to hear from her talk today um, to really not just give a paper that she's been thinking about, but think about what we all can collectively be talking and thinking about um, in this particular moment um, and considering the larger themes of the conference. So with that said, um, I know we're in a format where this is the panel and you all are sitting and looking up here, but we would like as much as possible for this to be a conversation after Professor James shares her remarks. Um, we will have a lot of time and we encourage you to ask questions, share thoughts, share about your own work. Even if your question is, I didn't understand that one piece, um, we think that that is a really important part of the learning process and something that we try to privilege in the reading group, which Felicia will talk about. So thank you for being here. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Felicia Deneau. I'm a PhD candidate in Africana Studies here at Brown University, and I'm the co-facilitator with Connor of the Carceral State Reading Group this year. Um, so welcome to our joint session with Dr. Joy James. We're grateful to the conference organizer, participants, workers for offering up this opportunity. We are grateful to Dr. James whose lethal combination of generosity, rigor, and intensity challenges the people around her to show up. The Carswell State Reading Group is a collection, or perhaps commons, of Brown students, formerly incarcerated organizers, practitioners, artists, professors, plotters of all kinds. We are committed to serious study, intellectual vulnerability, 
and collaborative creation as we develop analyses around contemporary conditions of captivity and relationships to help us contest and outlive, is a category I'm thinking about lately, um, outlive these conditions. We meet twice a month. We, have, we start up next semester, and this semester has been about getting a vision, sensing interest, going out into the community and finding places where we'll meet because it won't be at Brown all the time. We're trying to really weave our presence and see where people need us and where we can show up for what's already on the ground going on. Um, yeah, so we meet twice a month regularly for two hours around dinner. We provide childcare, transportation, and there's an assigned reading or a film, poem. We're trying to expand the mediums. Um, but this, for me, is black study under duress and in pursuit of the end of captivity. Um, that's what this space provides for me. We think, we meet, we propose, we organize with that urgency and in honor of that urgency. Um, and if so much of what the prison and the state does is disappear, redact, and isolate, we seek to see each other, touch each other, feel, and present one another. Uh, in 2002, when asked to reflect on 9-11, which perhaps is a moment in the framing of this conference, we could think about that as a, a mark we should, we don't think about enough maybe as black folks, um, but we should. Uh, Dr. James wrote, the Radical History Review's request for reflections leaves me feeling uncomfortable. How to place myself in my words and on a political landscape marred by crises. For some reason, I feel compelled to try to answer an insistent query. What did you do during the war? And the sotto voce interrogation, what are you doing during the wars? I invite you to think about what are you doing during the wars? The Carceral State Reading Group is one answer among many for me, this conference another. What are you doing during the wars? I was going to say some quotes, but I've taken up enough space, so I will pass it on to Connor, who will introduce Dr. James. Thank you, Felicia and Sophie. Um, I'm Connor. I'm also an undergraduate student worker at the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Um, and I'm really thankful for Sophie and Felicia and the love and earnestness they've poured into this group into making this space possible. Um, I have the privilege of introducing our keynote lecturer for this event right now, um, Professor Joy James. Joy James is the F.C. Oakley III professor at Williams College, where she teaches in political science, humanities, Africana studies, Women and Gender Studies, and American Studies. Professor James's anthologies, Critiquing Incarceration and Policing, include The New Abolitionists, Imprisoned Intellectuals, The Angela Y. Davis Reader, States of Confinement, and Warfare in the American Homeland, all works that engage critical writings from the perspectives of social justice activ activists, human rights advocates, and revolutionary political prisoners. Co-editor of the 2016 Abolition Collective Elections blog, James, James's most recent book is Seeking the Beloved Community. Author of The Womb of Western Theory, she has completed draft monographs on the eclipse of the revolutionary era and abolitionist architects Ange Angela Y. Davis and George Jackson and Fulcrum, The Captive Maternal Leverages Democracy. And with that, a warm welcome for Professor James. And then as I invite, um, I just wanted to quickly mention, um, first off, to thanks to Kristen May, who co-facilitated the reading group last year, a PhD in Africana Studies, who's um, based in New York this year, so she couldn't be with us today, but the two of us co-facilitated the group last year. Um, and also, I wanted to invite Felicia and Drea up to the panel. Um, inspired by the last conversation and kind of the ways in which the last panel very much intertwines with what we were hoping to talk and think about during this panel, we've decided to um, invite Drea and Felicia to join Professor James and be in conversation after Professor James presents her pa paper. Okay, so good afternoon. Yeah, and um, I wanna also offer my thanks Thanks to CSSJ, to the Carceral Reading Group, the network, um, to Professor Bogues. This is quite a unique um, endeavor, and it's victorious in its own ways. And particularly, thank you to the students from MEP on the previous panel, 
because not only is it inspirational, it's also a reminder, um, being an older person who has younger people, of the necessity to leave a legacy, but also to learn from the legacies that are being created by the young, and to also take tutoring from them as well. So my appreciation. I want to um, work in this collective format because that's how I think best. So I was very happy when Professor Bokes this morning said this was more of a workshop than any other kind of endeavor. Um, I believe in the notion, it's not just a notion, but the practice of cadre theory, that it's collective thinking that moves us forward, and it's collective thinking that provides incisive analyses that really can turn mundane or state theory on its head enable it to work better for the liberation of people. I want to, um, okay, thinking creatively means I can also be scattershot, right? Mm -hmm. So I used alliteration to kind of keep it together, um, but I'm gonna bring the, blame that on Professor Bogues. If you're like, where is she going? What is she talking about? He said, do what I wanna do. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanna talk about chronology, chaos, captive maternal functions, and cadre theory rebellions. So those are the four C's that I'm using today. I understand that some of that language or terminology will be unfamiliar, but maybe we can unpack it. Um, before I start, I want to pay tribute or recognition to Fred Hampton. So December 4th would have been the 50th anniversary of his assassination, and it is technically, legally an assassination, even though the government um, accepts no culpability, they did issue a $1.8 million settlement to Fred Hampton's family and also the family of Mark Clark for the pre-dawn raid in Chicago that killed a young Panther leader. I wanna show a short clip of Hampton. Uh, speaking not in the past when I've shown clips, it's always been about power and it's language that he starts with first seem disruptive to some people who think of the Panthers in a very narrow way. And I appreciate the visual that you guys got. And like, if I could fit it in my luggage, you wouldn't see it again, but I mean, so I'm just being like my own vulnerabilities. It's a gift from some black folks sometimes. Okay, so I can't steal from black people. Okay, fine. Um, so in the past, if you Google Hampton, right, 21 years old when he was killed. And we can talk about Freddie Gray killed at the age of 25, Trayvon Martin and this bogus traumatic lawsuit, right? you know, killed as a teenager, but Hampton was an intellectual, and is, if you think of the afterlife, not only of slavery, but the afterlife of rebellion for freedom, right? And so in the past, I've used clips where he would say, and this is what I mean by the disruptor, when we think only in terms of race and ethnicity, white power to white people, brown power to brown people, red power to red people, yellow power to yellow people, black power to black people, power to the people but not to the police. So the reparations, and I don't have time to unpack everything, but the reparations I'm talking about today are really the reparation of empowerment when you actually control the levels of police violence in your lives and your communities. That does not come with a check. But in fact, the ability to control violence is the ability to engage in stable living and the reproduction of communities that are healthy. So this clip on Hampton is not the chant of black power as people power, or people power as democracy, the path to democracy, it's on education. And I think it's telling that the Chicago Teachers Union distributed a Twitter in which they use this clip of Hampton. I have to also do the warning. Um, he uses expletives, so I know they're under 18, but they're expletives used in this um, documentary or this short video clip of five um, minutes. I think it's interesting that teachers who struck successfully in Chicago on behalf of children who were homeless, who were not receiving adequate education, who were denied services based on being differently abled, what some people call disabilities, would circulate this clip on education. And it affirms for me, when I've looked at all types of political struggle and tried to be useful to some, it affirms for me the importance of education itself. And that education is not the privilege as we know of institutions, but it's the privilege of the streets. And so this from Fred Hampton, if we can cue this up.
you know, basically knowing my ideology and basically you knowing me knowing yours, you can uh, support some of our programs. Is that what you're saying? Why not? And you believe in programs like the Breast for Children program and free health clinics? Right on, brother? We believe they're good things. Uh huh. As a focal point to organize their mothers and fathers. Uh huh. Peace. There's no educational program here? Uh, that's come out of social action. Um, you know, you set that up, bro. I mean, we can't put everything on one piece of paper. What about this bank? Credit union? Mm -hmm. Credit union. Credit union, my brother. Is a if bank. You're hip to, are you hip to credit unions? It is a bank. Yeah, you go and buy money? Yeah. Yeah, it's a bank. It's a bank. Owned by the people. Run for the people. And by the people. What will money be given out to people for? Well, the people would decide that. You want to buy, you know, whatever, you know, the people in the community would decide. You need some living room furniture, maybe? You need a car, maybe? See, I got, the thing is with me, you dig, I, I need to know some more about it. I wish you had some more literature about the educational thing here. Because, you dig, as far as we're concerned, you know, in the struggle, where we look at struggle, is that uh, this depends on the educational thing, you dig. Because of this depends on the education. Well, the whole thing. No, but in the end, this does. You, you can form yeah. this with no education. You uh, can form this. this. No, not the way we're talking about forming it. You know, right. We're talking about forming it right. You know, it's not on the paper. We didn't write it on no, the paper. Form it right with no education. No. Let me give you an example. Uh, you, Mo, you, your Mo Kenyatta formed the excellent revolution with no education. And on the day of the end day, your Mo told the motherfucker, I said, well, uh, you know, uh, you've been educated to uh, uh, hate the enemy, but uh, I'm your brother. I'll help you lead the revolution. Now I'm more pressure. Another example, Papa Doc in Haiti. Papa Doc in Haiti hated everything white. Man, you couldn't put this white paper in front of Papa Doc's face. But he moved all the white people out and he took over them to be oppressed. Yeah, he did. Because no education. And the people that have been educated, they just said that we don't hate the motherfucker right. white people, we hate the oppressor, whether he be white, black, brown, or yellow. So we got to know your educational program to find out what is going to be in the finale. A lot of people work. Your Mo Kenyatta is called not a never a revolutionary, but an ex-revolutionary. So it's Papa Doc. They brought on a successful revolution. That thing in under my mind was a bitch. Bantu freedom fighters, all that kind of action. But what we're saying is, that it's the end. But you don't judge Castro now. You can't do it. Nobody in this room could judge whether Castro's going to be a revolutionary or not. Uh, you know what I mean? We're talking about things, you know what I mean, uh, with uh, China, the People's Republic, and even at the stage they're in now, talking about even going on further into a communistic state. That's what we're talking about. Those are revolutionary. So we got to understand here the educational program that you have to be able to figure out whether it will go on the right lines where the people will end up in a situation where they can be able to really control themselves. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, with no education, the people that take this local foundation and start stealing money because they won't be really educated to why it's the people thing anyway. You understand what I'm saying? With no education, you have neo-colonialism instead of colonialism like you got in uh, Africa 9, like you got in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Haiti. So what we're talking about is there has to be uh, an educational program. That's very important. As a matter of fact, we are so important for us that a person has to go through six weeks of our political education before he can consider himself a member of the party, able to even run down ideology for the party. Why? Because if they don't have an education, then they know where. You dig what I'm saying? They know where because they don't even know why they're doing what they're doing. You, you might get people caught up in the emotionless movement. Uh, you understand me? You might be, get them caught up in because they're poor and they want something. And then if they're not educated, they want more. And before you know it, they'll be capitalists. And before you know it, we'll have Negro imperialists. All right. So I'm going to, one more minute, and I'll start the reading. Um, so in the past, when I've had a critique of POTUS 44, which would be Barack Obama, I would speak of him as the first um, elected black president of the United States. But then increasingly, uh, after the 2008 election, I began to refer to him as the first black imperial president of the United States, right? That the function of the US tied to capitalism, tied to wars of intervention, tied to, um, you know, the, the cliche now is bailing out Wall Street instead of um, people focusing on billionaires instead of the average worker or the unemployed has skewed um, the ways in which our democracy functioned and that POTUS 45, of course, has um, brought new areas of concern, right, that are obviously expressed in the impeachment proceedings. So chronology, chaos, captive maternal, and cadre theory. So in terms of the chronology, it was the Black Panther who introduced me to the idea of doing the anthologies that were listed by, Con was it Connor? 
or whoever read them off, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. um, but that happened after I did a prototype for critical resistance at CU Boulder. And because I had met a panther doing organizing in New York, they suggested that the anthology that came of that, which is States of Confinement, which doesn't get talked about it much, but I had negotiated for the publisher Palgrave to mail 50 copies into prison so that incarcerated readers, what I call imprisoned intellectuals, could study the anthology. It was the panther who wrote back who said the anthology had limited usefulness in terms of people who were long-term detainees, right? That there was a way in which academic theory even if it included people who have been incarcerated in the past, structured both the ambition of the thinking and the procedure of it, right? That couldn't express the meaning of what it meant to be a long-term captive who is incarcerated because they participated in a rebellion. That particular uh, panther that I'm talking about, and I can't say his name because he is still in prison, and we did that anthology like in 2002, I believe. Um, deny parole because he was engaged in a war. And I know there are different ways to define warfare. But in this historical era, and I, you saw Fred, I told you he was assassinated. In this historical era in which activists were killed, including those who were not engaged in violent activities, which would be Fred, who was a former leader of the NAACP youth wing, right? But did believe in armed self-defense as the Panthers did. In this historical era, some people made choices. And those choices led to um, them being targeted. And COINTELPRO also targeted Martin Luther King, uh, who is a pacifist. And some of them engaged in firefights with the police. So the person that I'm talking about now has been in for, is going on their 49th year and was denied parole a couple months ago. So for the last year or so, I've been wondering, how do you free people who are considered a political threat, not because in the age of 78 or 79, they are a physical threat, but they are an ideological threat. Does that make sense? That the very ideas that they embody, right? The critique of capital, the critique of police violence, the desire not so much, and I think this came up in the previous panel, to integrate into a structure that does not open the doors for everyone, right? But to rethink the world, which I call um, a theoretical revolution, right? That that, in fact, becomes the crime that must be punished to death, right? That you literally you die inside. So the only way to gain traction, I thought, to bring attention to political prisoners. We did that like over a decade ago at Brown where the undergraduate students were instrumental in doing the anthologies, New Abolitionists and Prison Intellectuals. They did a lot of the groundwork. They helped organize the conference. The only way I thought we could do gain, gain traction to bring more attention in this current era would be to link it to reparations. But the more I've listened to the discussions last night, both you know the presentation, but also um, at dinner, um, to the panels this morning, uh, and the panel that's to come, having a brief conversation with um, at least one of the participants, I don't believe that reparations as we think about it is possible unless we can actually control the levels of violence. I don't believe we can control levels of violence unless we can control to some way the executive branch would be the POTUS. I don't think that voting by itself will be sufficient to control that level of administration in terms of governance. So the chronology is that a panther inspired me to think, led to t almost 10 years of anthologizing. My sense of futility in helping people get parole, not because they don't deserve it, clearly they've met all the requirements for parole, but because you couldn't cut through the political ideology that prohibits revolutionary thinking whether it's pacifist or not pacifist, has led me to the moment of what I would call chaos. And so in this moment of chaos, this sort of gets embodied in one singular individual, which would be 45. Again, it's been said earlier on earlier panels, chaos existed before 45. There was chaos under 44. If you want to talk about the neglect of impoverished people, if you want to talk about climate devastation, we could go down the list. We could check all the boxes. It's just the very appearance of duplicity, right? It's, it resonates so more with the particular individual that they become the personification of what is wrong with democracy. 
I am going to argue now as I begin to read about the captive maternal. I'm going to argue that democracy inherently has a predatory tendency in relationship as Professor Bogues and others have said it's preceded 1619, has a predatory habit or addiction to expropriation and exploitation of the captive subject as black. I'm going to define the captive maternal as an ungendered phenomenon, right? That it's not necessarily feminized in a female form. So this is not a form of black feminism, even though I did black feminism in the 90s. That sounds like that's a horrible thing to say. But I've, I'm not saying I moved beyond it, but I learned a lot from it. I don't think that feminism as an ideology can deliver. I don't think you know, socialism or, you know, Sanders, who I think comes closest to progressivism, the DSA, Democratic Socialist version. I, I'm a member of DSA and other groups, right? I don't think that it necessarily can deliver. I think there have been aspects of the presentations over the last two days that points to a subject object that is the foundation of capital and accumulation, but it's also the target of terror. And that the remedies that have been presented before us cannot push against that terror unless we rethink both the function of the captive maternal and also move towards cadre theory. So I'm going to start reading, and I'm going to try to fast read. And what, do you want to time me? You can do that. OK. Let me know at a 20-minute mark, OK? OK. All right, so I think this upcoming election is really important. I think, again, this has come up. We should push against gerrymandering, voter disenfranchisement, et cetera, et cetera. But this upcoming election will not be sufficient. And I want to theorize, then, about the captive maternal. And I want to use three templates for it, Sally, Michelle, and Deborah, and talk about the ways in which, even in our own black communities, we're fractured by where we think agency comes from and who we think holds the ideological um, template or key to open the door to whatever version of freedom we can get in this moment. So into the breach, captive maternal Sally, Michelle, and Deborah. Here's a quote from Deborah Danner. I smile rarely, but I am surviving. Variations of Deborah Danner's quote about battling schizophrenia might have been uttered by Sally Hemings or Michelle Obama. Women of African descent, descent who as captive maternals serve as historical markers for democracy and U.S. presidents. In the womb of Western theory, I discuss how ungendered, feminized caretakers of historically enslaved and disenfranchised black communities become captive to a predatory democracy. Denying black freedom and female child emancipation, such a democracy redirects the generative powers of oppressed caretakers away from rebellion and into stabilizing the reproduction of societies steeped in theft, trauma, violence, and consumption. American democracy is a continued rebirth of a lineage of captivity. Here, three black women illustrate the reproduction of policing by tacit or explicit permission from white or black presidents of the United States, referred um, from here as uh, POTUS. In the 18th century, Sally Hemings became Thomas Jefferson's enslaved concubine through his marriage to his half-sister, Martha. And I think it's important, like the other night, that you, where you used the the slave ship, right, as a schematic. I'm going to use Hemings as a historical um, construct. In the 21st century, Michelle Obama made history as the original official African-American First Lady of the United States, or FLOTUS, through her marriage to Barack Obama. After eight years serving as the first black president of an imperial nation, POTUS 44 passed his presidential mantle on to 45. Donald Trump, the 21st century's first POTUS, to openly channel white nationalism and violent policing and militarism. The function of the captive maternal, and yes, it's codified before 1619, ranges, or the functions range beyond forced ministrations to white property ma males who held blacks and pregnant teens captive. Their lineage of coercion and consumption did not disappear as democracy evolved to permit black power simulacra and celebrations in which a Princeton Harvard grad metamorphizes from an anti-racist, quote, angry black woman, end quote, into a charismatic, glamorous flotus, mothering a colorblind nation into civility. Democracy's historical predatory trajectory remains intact in the stripping of sovereignty 
and sanctuary from captive maternals. Enslaved 200 years ago, Hemings wears her hard-earned honorific title, Flotus, as a crown of thorns. How she rebuilt as a CM or captive maternal has no written record. Jefferson's daughter, Martha, burned all papers um, about um, Hemings from her father's estate. Two centuries from now, we might have little knowledge of how Michelle Obama revolted against police and prison violence, devastating disenfranchised communities. Danner, though, leaves a clear record and blood trail of rebellion, if we can remember her. Danner's diligence to escape her fate, about which she had prescient theory, entailed years of exhausting negotiations around family, social workers, prescription drugs, and poverty, NYCHA, which is New York City Housing Authority, Public Housing, and the NYPD. Unlike Flotus's Sally and Michelle, Deborah's mental illness, blackness, and impoverished despair are stripped of romanticism and belonging. She reflects the microcosm and prison for violent policing, ineffectually mourned by 44 and championed by 45. Hemings augments Thomas's electoral college gains via the three-fifth clause as her or their progeny garnered votes for Southern slaveholding presidents. So of course, Jefferson in 1800 could defeat John Adams because you get to count your slaves, including his children by Hemings. Michelle Obama cheers multicultural liberalism to validate Barack's opposition to rebellions against state violence and capitalism. Danner's neuroatypical self-defensive aggression is her death sentence, but Donald's homicidal boast that he could shoot anyone on Fifth Avenue with impunity promotes his path to the White House. Despite progress, presidential signings and decrees usher in betrayals. The 13th Amendment, which supposedly emancipated but legalizes slavery for those who are incarcerated. The 14th Amendment, which was to garner you rights, but then over time with the Supreme Court transferred personhood to corporations, which is how you get Citizens United and unlimited spending because they're people or they have personhood. The Voting Rights Act was decimated, decimated by gerrymandering and voter suppression, which I mentioned earlier. Presidential powers, both symbolic and derived from executive powers, address, ignore, or exacerbate violent policing and imprisonment and the spatial dislocation of the black, poor, queered, and medically fragile. Executives control the police and prisons that shape the democratic womb to usurp and repurpose the generative powers of captive maternals. Constitutional norms historically offered few protections to captive maternals. White supremacist terrorism, police killings, prison violence, state executions, and lack of redress of rape, coupled with increasing restrictions on abortion, reflect how the civil rights of commoners dissipate before the powerful benevolence and or malevolence of elites and celebrities whose political advocacy refuses to battle police violence targeting the most vulnerable. On October 18, 2016, an isolated elderly black woman who had not taken her medication, stood in her Bronx NYCHA bedroom in bathroom robe. She clutched a baseball bat to ward off a white officer too impatient to wait for mental health mediators as police protocol required. Sergeant Hugh Barry's gunshot into Deborah Danner's chest would be officially declared as justifiable in a trial that acquitted him of three charges, murder, manslaughter, and criminally negligent homicide. The year before Danner's police execution, Freddie Gray, who suffered from neurological disorders linked to childhood lead paint poisoning in subsidized housing, became a victim of police homicide on April 19, 2015. The 25-year-old severed spine and coma while in police custody, allegedly from a shackled, quote, rough ride in the back of a police van. And I'm sorry that I didn't mention before about, like, some of this content is um, disturbing and... Uh, secondary and tertiary trauma, I imagine, led to Baltimore rebellions. In a national address, 44 castigated protesters as, quote, thugs. He later retracted the pejorative and lamented the absence of adequate support for poor families, which, in fact, is the role of function of captive maternal. And claiming, um, as POTUS did, the inability of the president to, quote, federalize or control predatory police personnel. So then, in fact, what Obama did was to say that he was a victim of his own police forces. 
Gray's death sparked the burning of city real estate, while Danner's death symbolized spatial dislocation, distance from the streets, and most political memories of lynching to embody the black, impoverished, feminized sufferer whose only mother is herself. So because she was schizophrenic, her family essentially abandoned her because she was, quote, too much to care for, which, you know, I don't fault them for given the lack of services in New York City. Danner's devastating demise at the hands of police is met with a more muted response, given that most recognizable vulnerability is framed by masculinized black youths, who also shoulder captive maternal vulnerabilities and functions. A tragic representation of violent policing mourned by 44 and championed by 45, Danner remains an anti flotus lacking personal beauty, a personal attachment to a powerful man, her combative stance against violent policing registered less as political disaffection and more as mental illness for the public who is even concerned about her demise. Without masculinity or family kin actively preserving the memory of her murder, and so we recall, right, the mothers of the movement who became um, surrogates for Hillary Clinton, kept, and that would have been Trayvon Martin's mother, Sandra Bland's mother, right, um, kept the memory of their slain youth alive. So in the absence of a family, right, of a parental or sisterly or brotherly um, agency, one disappears in terms of their homicide at the hands of police. So there's no rebellion for Danner as a gravestone, while there is a rebellion for others, right? Danner and death does not easily survive then in political memory. Her political anonymity as a fighter, not just a victim, connects plantation, which would be Hemings, university, elite university, which would be uh, Michelle Obama, and public housing. She shares the common invisibility of captive maternals in sites where presidential power and governmental policy regulate or enable the womb of predatory democracy, which gave birth to the slave, prisoner, welfare queen, queen, queen super predator, father who won't pull up his pants or pick up his kids. These are all stereotypes, you know, right? And immigrants from Yes, whatever whole countries plundered by the West. On the continuum of disposability and potential rebellion, all captive maternals are related. All are tethered to POTUSes. Captive maternals endure what POTUSes allow. Police torture and terror, FBI, DOG, re-engineering of COINTELPRO. So under the current POTUS, right, they're claiming they're black identity extremists linked to Black Lives Matter who actually are pacifists, right? and are doing civil rights organizing. But if you can link them as black identity extremists at the same time white supremacists are doing mass killings, you can deflect attention from white supremacists doing mass killings and focus on black civil rights activists by criminalizing them. We also face, there is the march outside now, climate devastation, environmental racism, schooling as it was noted that fails our youth and children, criminalization and neglect of those who are differently able. And even though I don't want to go on about Greta Thunberg, she is interesting, right? Because in one part, she claims that Asperger's is a superpower. So I was starting to think when I was listening to the panel about trauma, is it possible that our trauma could be a superpower? That the way that we're wired with hyper attentiveness to threat that the way in which stress works its way through our systems could actually not be just a deficit, but an enabling capacity. I could go on with the list. I'll move forward to the close. Democracy's predatory womb tears as government employees violently terminate the mundane living captive maternal saver. And I don't have time to go into these specific, but you're aware of these cases and we could talk more. And the mundane living, I'm saying, is about people who not necessarily saw themselves as activists or agitators, but as caretakers of their community and can. So that their capacity to love would be what would be, um, in ways, a salve or corrective to the trauma they experience. So the two I cite here are Botham Jean, eating ice cream while watching television, and Tatiana Jefferson, babysitting in a late night breeze through an open front door. The last part then points to Cadre. With no deference to presidential discourse or dictate, captive maternals as Cadre theorists, those who've decided that caretaking is not sufficient and that rebellion might be a necessity, work to rupture a continuum that reproduces the cage. And therefore, they throw into the breach the legacies of Sally Hemings, 
Michelle Obama, and Deborah Danner. And I think what is, I know what is very important to me then would be in what way could the cadre theory stabilize the future child? And I want to cite one last thing and I'll stop. So I've been following some of the scientific literature around schooling, particularly in New York City, where I've also been active um, with parents around children who are um, differently able or who would be labeled as disabled or having disabilities, the way in which they don't get resources. But I've been noticing that in the scientific literature, right, in terms of the reproductive capacity that caretakers have and the theft of that capacity to stabilize capitalism in a racial democracy, that Scientific America reported this week that black women are having low birth weight babies because of the shooting of unarmed black people. And, they, and this is, um, and I could talk to you more about it or give you the citation. So this is a scholar at Harvard. I'd heard the data before that black women are having low birth weight babies. And then basically scientists were saying, it's not about poverty. It's not about geographical location, whatever. It's about racism. But then racism becomes this abstraction that they don't unpack, right? But the low birth weight babies um, concerning police homicides is tied specifically to unarmed blacks. That if the news reports that there's a black suspect who was armed, who was killed, based on their study, which um, took quite a collection of data, it's in Scientific American if you want to look at the sources, there was a, <coughs> a level of threat and fear that circled through or cycled through the mother's nervous system. Because the assumption is that if you were confronting the police in a militaristic or armed fashion, there's a logic to your death. There's a logic to your captivity. It's what the mothers who are pregnant couldn't reconcile, that if you were, and we all know the language, like if driving while black, voting while black, walking while black, anything while black, and you were shot, then it was the irrationality of the violence and also the notion that it would be a collective punishment because there was no rationale that began to have negative impact on the well-being of black pregnant women. And the future that we owe our children would be to undo the capacity to recycle irrational violence throughout the society. And again, this is because it is an empire is not just about your local police. It is not just about the FBI. It is also about the CIA. It is also about the US intervention since World War II in destabilizing democracies. We could go talk about Brazil. We could talk about El Salvador. We could talk about a number of things, a number of sites. And at times, this would seem daunting. Uh, not just at times, right? But I believe the capacity of care that we have in the middle of our fragility is a superpower. And that it's linked to our collective ability to theorize beyond precarity and vulnerability. And so again, I'm grateful for this forum for CSSJ that this becomes a space where we can think, we can organize, and we can reinvent theory and think more closely about freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. James. That is this on? Yeah. Um, that was a lot. That was um, you gave us a lot to work with, and maybe we can ask questions uh, and or put a point on the table, each of us, and then we really want to open it up um, and let this be a dialogue. We had wanted it to be a circle, but that was logistically impossible. Uh, so please step in, step up in whatever way the conversation, the material that Dr. James asked you to consider compels you to go, and we'll, we'll follow. Um, I just want to put fragments on the table. There's a, a, a novel that I'm obsessed with right now by Evelyn Trio, who's a Haitian author, called The Infamous Rosalie. And the Rosalie is this, the slave ship that this lineage, this genealogy of women come over on. 
And so the story focuses on Lisette, who is born in Haiti. So she's, or Saint Domingue. So she's considered a Creole. And her mother and her mother's sort of community, people that she's captive with on the boat, are considered Bosaos, who are captives born in Africa, brought to the, the New World. Um, so Lisette, I, I don't want to spoil the book. It's still riveting, so, but I am going to spoil a little bit of it. There's a line that I can't get out of my head. And Lisette says this to her unborn child as she's fleeing. So the, re the Haitian Revolution is, you know, it's, the text takes place basically in the 1760s, but it's trying to give you a snapshot of the years before the revolution erupts. Um, and there's a big poisoning campaign going on, and it's all about rumor and fear and paranoia brewing among the whites on the island. And she's deciding whether she wants to join the revolutionary effort, um, and she's pregnant. So she looks at her stomach as she's running, and she says, you will be born free and rebellious, or you, not, you will not be born at all. And it is a commentary on this relationship I'm thinking between abolition and abortion. And she says that for a reason. She has a rope tied around her stomach. And the rope, and this is based on archival research, it's a story Evelyn Trio found, is from a, a healer who, and the rope had 76 knots on it. And those are the 76 um, infants that she decided in collaboration with the enslaved captive women to kill. And so the rope was passed down for the different women. And now Lisette ended up with it. And so she has it tied around her pregnant stomach. And the last line of the book is, you will be born free and rebellious, or you, you will not be born at all. And so the, uh, the captive maternal, um, this question of controlling the terms of violence. One of my undergrad students is really trying to understand, like, oh. That was yours. What is the nature of violence? That's what he said in class, global black radicalism. Like, is it natural? You know, and he really was like, is violence natural? And the cast had a very compelling conversation about what is the human relationship to violence? Can we plan backwards? So if we know there will be violence, can we control the terms of violence? Or can we not dictate terms of violence? Because we don't want there to be violence, but there will be violence. And so what do we do with that? Um, so I'm thinking about reproduction. I would love to hear from if people work in reproductive justice, but this, what the captive maternal does for you, because there's the caretaking as a reproductive work, but my own dissertation is looking at what I'm calling modernity as an unnameable war on the black captive. And the stakes of the unnameable war are to produce not just power, but to make power. So I look at how nuclear, the atomic bomb that's dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, all the uranium comes from the Congo, the Katanga region, because it's the most enriched uranium on the planet. And so what does black exposure have to do with the capacity to make war? and continuous black exposure, this reproduction to the exposure to violence is what allows new technologies. Had that uranium not been available through colonial onslaught, had that shadow war in the Congo fought that no one talks about over uranium, what, what would World War II look like? And what does the black captive have to do with the reproduction of the terms of global life itself and this, this war that we kind of are amorphously talking about and how the Panthers were situated at a moment in this war where they had to make certain decisions and now we sit in a different moment. And so Dr. James asked me yesterday, well, if you name the violence as such, as a war, if you respond to the call toward the declaration of war, what does violence become in our own life? And so I just am compelled, I'll be one more thing, um, switching gears, or going from Evelyn Trio's text, and this authority, giving birth and taking life being complementary rights or contentions that the black woman has to deal with, and then going to Papa Doc, which um, we get in the video a little bit from Hampton. And Papa Doc was, 
some of the war, and imagine Haiti's legacy, but real terror. I mean, thousands and thousands have disappeared under brutal conditions and a real psychological violence that was consolidated through a black nationalist program. And that's what Hampton's getting at, is that it was in the name of a kind of black nationalism. And that's why he calls him an extra revolutionary, because it's brilliant but we are unable to identify the enemy, as Hampton you know, puts on the table. So I want to think about from Lisette and the Beausalles and on the plantation in, Haiti, in Saint-Domingue to Papa Doc and the manipulation of black nationalism, of the potential, that closure. Um, and then another piece I'm thinking about is Hampton, they speculate, was poisoned. I mean, really thinking about, this is espionage. And then other captive maternals, we have Corinne Gaines in Baltimore, who we also had lead exposure, in addition to Freddie Gray. And so I'm, I'm thinking about how do we start identifying, or what do all these scales mean? Where lead, uranium, blackness, war, and how do we start, and then what is the risk of identifying this and naming it as such? And I don't know, how do we develop that language? But I have a lot of other thoughts. Thank you, that was very um, rich. And I'll, I want to turn it to you and to see if the piece on education, um, because that's what your panel was on before, um, what resonated with you from what Hampton said or uh, Dr. James's remarks. But thinking about maybe violence is on the table, um, educate, you guys are talking about healing a lot. So I don't know, after hearing all of these remarks, where are you at with healing and the idea of trauma being like a cognitive, I don't want to call it a cognitive opening, but a theoretical revolution where we have to think otherwise because they forced us. I don't know, I'm thinking about those things, but yeah. Where does this leave you? Um, so I did some, so I did some readings. Um, actually that you guys have done Carcel State Reading Group um, on Freddie um, Freddie Gray um, Fred Hampton um, and as I was reading I was I honestly wasn't shocked um, it came as oh okay mm. like it was kind of normal to me mm. because of the fact of how the simp the system works with people of color and um, black people. Um, it was kind of, I was reading it and like, I was like, oh, like I had empathy and I had, I felt, you know, I kind of felt the pain of him um, and what happened and I, but it was normal to me because of just the simple fact of how society is today and how it was back then and how it has continued and in different forms. Um, I think that it's the way that society is today is we have to um, bear, we have to live with that trauma and be aware and be um, kind of prepared for the trauma. Um, I think that mm. it's, um, as a high school student, um, it's, it's just normal now I feel it's more normalized and all, all of these things are happening in the world and who that has happened um, in, in the past um, it's just it's normalized now and I think that that's what's wrong with the society is that it's happened so much that we expect it and we kind of are just like oh that just happened again another black person shot another cop killed an innocent young black man or another black person who's wrongfully convicted. Um, and I think that it's just abusive power and we're just kind of set to, we're kind of taught to not really fight against it, but more to just accept it as it is. Mm -hmm. um, and the educational piece of what the trauma, I think, is um, like how black families and people of color have to give these kind of lectures and these speeches to their children about, oh, like the cops aren't your friend, these people aren't your friends. Um, if this happens, do this and this and this. And um, 
you kind of have to mentally prepare and kind of have to prepare your children and the generations after and even yourself. And it's hard, but it's normalized in the society. And I think the educational piece today is just um, kind of taking it in and accepting it. But it's like if we try to fight it, it's wrong. Yeah, I'm trying to say. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if I explained that. Yeah, right. no, that yeah. Makes sense. yeah. They want you to have an understanding of your own kind of condition without yeah. moving against it. Yeah. And yeah, education is about towing that line, about telling you something maybe about history, mm -hmm. but not enough where you feel where the call to riot. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah. So thanks for that, both of you. Yeah, I feel that. If there's a dichotomy between black suffering and black rebellion, and I'm not saying black rebellion equals a riot, right? Um, because there's different kinds of revolutionaries. Like Martin Luther King was a revolutionary, definitely at the time that he was assassinated, because he had a critique of capitalism and he had a critique of the war in Vietnam, which was imperialism. But that's also when his funding dried up and when civil rights leaders stopped returning his phone call. So he still had the same spiritual template, right? And his hope was a, sort of the hope of the afterlife. You know, that last speech, I mean, I get there with you, but I promise that we as a people, you know, we will see the promised land. It's a promissory note, mm -hmm. um, likely not cashed, like in, definitely not in my lifetime, right? But I think the dichotomy is between black suffering and black rebellion. And so that the society has agreed that black suffering is, as you both eloquently stated, is normative. It's part of, you know, you wake up in the morning, the air you breathe, your breakfast, whatever, just expect on some level, some register of black suffering. That it is, it is the oxygen, it's in the air. It is not that intangible. It's concretized actually to policing, paramilitaries, bad teachers, bad, you know, we could go on the whole punitive carceral system that you both have studied well. Black rebellion though, it's prohibited. Whether it's pacifist is irrelevant. The very notion that you would break from structure becomes in itself an informal crime that becomes punished by lack of promotion, lack of public, you know, in the academic industry, right? So I've been really, you know, I've had people say, oh my God, it's so surprised you even got tenured anywhere. But, so, <laughs> one of the questions becomes, right, what is your lifeline in a society, and gradually your world, because the climate devastation, 100 million people will be migrating, looking for water, looking for food. You know we, know, we know what's happening in the moment in our lives and planet. What is your lifeline, you know, in terms of just being able to feed yourselves? And it's not, in my understanding, what I've learned, you know, from cadre theorists, it's impossible to do as an individual. I mean, there are ways that you can do Band-Aid, like, so the, what is the alternative to a traumatized school and a traumatized environment is to have access to hundreds of thousands of dollars and send your child to an, a private school where they can ride horses and you know, go skiing and you know, and so it's funny, but then it's not. So when I said I was organizing in New York City, I organized with black mothers from Harlem, but I also knew women who had hundred million dollar babies. So the black mothers like, oh, we want to teach our kids about castles, you go up to the cloisters. The other mother is like, I want to teach my kid about castle, we'll be in Spain for the holidays, right? And so the way in which wealth buffers trauma mm. is incredibly important to study. Mm. But also, and I'm going to be really clear about this, the way in which the black bourgeoisie has now access to that wealth has allowed it to be a multiracial presentation of a fortress that you know gives you, I saw the credit card you know, the other day on the display, but gives what you know, some people have called the civil rights credit card. If you can get one, you can swipe it, and then you get access to good things. But that's because you're the good person of color, or you're a good black person that you can function in structure, that you, you know, which means you will not conceptualize a rebellion against structure. Mm -hmm. So I see the conundrum as a captive maternal you know, the balance of the scale. You have to stabilize structure because you need to get your kid up in the morning and get them to school and they need to go to school and not be on the street. Like, you have to do this whole performative thing. Like, yeah, go siphon off my energy. I don't even believe in this system, but my kid needs to not be vulnerable to police power and vigilante aggression. Mm -hmm. 
But you have to also, which is I can't figure out exactly how, you have to be able to simultaneously disrupt structure or there will never be anything new for the future of the child. You will reproduce structure. And so your movements go into museums, or I like the, the term hegeog, I can't even pronounce it, hegeography that was stated earlier, or your movements are led by always stellar people who nobody could emulate because all movements are led by these brilliant, gifted people that we've never seen or we get only once every 50 years, which is not true. And so I think it's that, you know, oh, this phrase just came to mind, mine's so cheesy, I don't care anymore. Um, the notion of a loving rebellion. I have, I don't know how that works because I'm angry a lot, but <laughs> if you're around children, you can't afford to be angry all the time, right? And also understand, at least what I'm learning, I am part of structure, so what they will do is turn on me. And that's what's supposed to happen. A rebellion against me based on everything that I've absorbed to get a degree, to get tenured, and to teach in certain schools, which means I reproduce structure. Dr. James, can, oh, first, does anyone have any responses, questions? The door? Um, yeah, I just wanted, I'm going to move this back here actually. Just wanted to say thank you for the conversation. It's bringing up a lot of stuff in my mind as I'm thinking about my presentation coming up on the revolution in Sudan and the role that violence played. Um, and I find it really interesting, Felicia, what you mentioned about, you know, the Rosalie because it, it brings to mind, you know, Toni Morrison's clarifications on what the act of um, infanticide actually meant mm. in Beloved, right? Because most people assumed that it was, that she wanted to spare her children from the experience of enslavement. And when she clarified, she said, no, actually, it was a statement to the school teacher that you do what you want with what's yours, and these children are mine, so I do what I want with them, mm. right? Which is a very different thing from simply wanting to spare children from the actual experience of slavery. So. You know, what does it mean to kind of shift the understanding of even those refusals, which look one way on the surface, right? But then when you lift the veil, there's a, there's a much more pointed critique of what's at stake. Mm -hmm. um, and in thinking, about, in thinking about violence, there was a point in Sudan in which things turned, right? It happened really slowly and then all at once. So in a way, people had a long time to think about things and also didn't have a lot of time to think about things uh, as they were happening. And um, the question that I think we're going to have to ask is what are we going to do when things turn? Because they're going to turn. And it's happening really slowly, but it's also going to happen all at once at some point. And so the question becomes, what are we going to do when things turn? In Sudan, they did things a certain way because it's a country that had been at war constantly um, for you know, 60 years. And the president was a wartime president. So for them, the break with the statement putting down weapons because that society had never actually been demilitarized, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for them, it meant putting down weapons. But the question I think we have to ask ourselves is what are we going to do when it turns, right? And what are we willing to do? Um, and us as, you know, elites, as we were talking about yesterday, are we willing to go? And if we go, I think we should be willing to go. And if we go, are we going to go willingly or are we going to be forced? I would rather go willingly personally. But, <laughs> um, yeah. Any responses to Bador's provocation that perhaps in the Panthers formulation, there's, we have to have a, a reading of the times and a, a sense of time and seizures being one way of like reading time. And um, I don't know, so maybe folks can think about the things that Bedore put on the table. Um, um, can I, yeah, so I'm really interested in Beloved, like in terms of my reading, like based on the Margaret Garner story, right, which is historical fact. I always felt, and I could be wrong in this, but I always felt that Morrison had the black community um, discipline. Is it Setha? The, the parental figure, for taking on the powers of a sovereign. Like Medea can do it in Euripides' play, right? 
and walk away after killing Jason's children. Mm -hmm. And there's no, this whole, like, the community's gonna crash down on Medea. And, no, she's the daughter of, like, a sun goddess or something, right? But the, the notion that black people would, and I'm not, I obviously I'm not recommending that, but the notion that black people could assert that sovereign right, the right of a deity, seems to be prohibited. Right, and then when I read Octavia Butler's sci-fi, though, mm. it like you know the wild card th just sort of appears in different ways. Like the notion of what is prohibited is not even a factor because we're already in the terrain of the surreal, right? I feel like there's there's a practicality to Morrison um, that you know is brilliant in her prose and her writing, but also tethers us to the known structure. Like in, in you know ways that could be productive, but also that could be disciplinary. Mm. That's interesting, especially considering you're thinking about um, the right to save my child from a particular trauma mm -hmm. versus the right to a child or to do what I want. Do what I want. So right. that's an interesting forms of possession, and and thinking maybe if we center the child. Um, yeah, I mean, how do we get out of forms of possession and, yeah. Okay, I gotta yeah. say one thing. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody needs to ask the child what they want. Exactly, that's what I, I was just like, hello, do yeah. I get a vote in this, right? It yeah. just seems, um, one quick example, so when I used to work with the mothers from Brazil who lost their children, right? And th there would be stories about, uh, and in some ways it parallels what happens in the US, like a paramilitary police killed your child and then it would be, we want to make amends, reparations if you, restitution. We can name a scholarship fund. We can give you monetary compensation. In the U.S., that's actually, there's a sad irony to this, right? The compensation is paid by your tax dollars, which means black people are paying for the settlements for killing black kids, mm -hmm. right? Um, but when they brought her to a meeting with her graduate student handlers and NGO, and she's sitting there in front of the officials, they're like, okay, basically, this sounds not nice, but here's the menu that we can offer you based on, you know, state procedure. And she made one demand that was unmeetable, which I consider revolutionary, which was resurrect the dead child. Essentially, if you want to act like a god, then be like a god and give me a resurrection. And then they walked her out, you know, you want Tylenol, you want water, okay, fix this and go back. And then she's like, okay, I had no to the Tylenol, take water. And they set her down at the table again. It was the same demand. And I see that in different ways with Erica Gardner, right? Mm -hmm. That ABC crafted thing on the anniversary of her death where Obama is there and Valerie Jarrett, and I've, I've spent a year just talking about Erica Gardner, and she goes to the ABC, um, you know, her father was killed in 2014, he was choked to death, uh, chest compression and choking. Um, by Pantaleo in New York City, Pantaleo was acquitted. She goes there thinking, being told, not just mm -hmm. thinking, that she can speak a tribute to her father's police homicide or murder. When she's get there, it's totally scripted, and it's like, no, you can't. The POTUS is gonna speak, they're gonna call on people, but they're gonna say the right thing within structure. And so she storms out yelling. So after she dies, essentially, you know, from grief and asthma and poverty and stress, at the age of 27, leaving behind a seven-month-old and a seven-year-old at the time, um, this video appears. And there's pre the president, there's Valerie Jarrett, who's his advisor, and there is Erica Garner. And the first thing Obama says is, you don't do it like that. Means that if you want access to power and redress, you work within structure. And then, of course, because he's very humane, he caught himself and he said, oh, my condolences. Then he doubled down. You don't do it like that. You don't yell. You don't storm. You don't have abrasive confrontations with people. Like the mandate of civility for grieving communities mm -hmm. is unbearable. And I think that produces another level of stress, mm -hmm. right? But then there's no outlet to it because we're told the way to have um, you know, any kind of remedy is to be deferential. So with, what when I was asking the Brazilian mothers, well, who are the captive maternals now? Because disproportionately, it's their sons. It's not just the Brazilian mothers. I've worked with mothers in Chicago whose, um, whose sons were killed by the Chicago police. Who takes over? And this goes back to child agency. It is usually the eldest daughter in the household, 
like your 11 year old, because now you're organizing to keep the memory of your slain child alive, mm -hmm. but Deborah Danner you know, did not have. Your oldest girl is the one who wakes up the younger siblings, right? And who gets them to school, who makes sure that they have lunch. So it's just a reproductive labor that increasingly children are becoming the captive maternals mm. of our communities. Uh, questions, responses? Um, thanks again for, for coming and lecture. Um, your, so I guess I have um, at least two questions. One, how does or how might uh, the concept of the capital maternal relate to the analytic of social reproduction as, um, as most commonly theorized by Marxist and materialist feminists? Um, that's one of the things I'm thinking about. Um, or, and also how does it, how might it exceed that analytic or complicate it? Um, and the other thing, uh, more so relates to a lecture from the past semester where you came as well and talked about the counter-revolution, um, like post the murder of George Jackson. Um, that brought to mind to me then, um, your book, uh, Transcending the Talented Tenth, um, and at the time, basically, I was wondering, like, how, how might that relate to the university as a site for the training ground of future cadres of black bourgeoisie and other neocolonial bourgeoisies? Did you guys want to address that first? Sorry? Did you want to say anything, address? Um well, it seems pretty tough. Okay. Directed towards you. I mean, I have thoughts yeah. on how the captive maternal destabilizes Marxist categories, but I'll let you. Okay. Uh, so um, <coughs> I'll start with the Talented Tenth, right? So the, the reason I did the Talented Tenth is that Charlene Mitchell, who um, is in her 80s now and lives in Harlem, uh, she's the person who recruited Angela Davis to the Communist Party, specifically the Che Lumumba Party in the late 1960s. And so, you know, named after Che Guevara and Patrice Lumumba, um, in a moment when the CPUSA, which was predominantly white and middle class, felt that it would be third world revolutionaries that would, you know, be the beacon for, you know, black young people and people of color and white militants too, who wanted to have an analysis and put front and center analysis of white supremacy or racial capitalism and not the traditional way. And I think Professor Boat spoke to this earlier, right? That if you, you did the timeline, it's, you, you can't start with Marx, right? You, you have to like see the world develop and evolve and accumulation occur out of this appropriation, um, theft and torture. Um, <coughs> Mitchell told me to go to the Schomburg and to look at Du Bois again, mm -hmm. right? And I didn't, I had, like my dissertation's on Hannah Arendt, right? So, and I heard when you said you never had a black teacher, I never had a black teacher in my life until I did a postdoc in seminary and got to work with James Cohn and Cornel West. Wow. So I was like almost 30 and so, wow. and it does, it, it it will, I don't know what it does to you, but anyway, it sort of warped my sense of competency, efficacy, and also a whole wealth of literature that you know, wasn't being delivered because mm. the people, at, their training was interesting and useful in some ways, but it was not as comprehensive if there had been more diversity. So it was Mitchell, Charlene, who says, look at Du Bois, go to the Schomburg, start doing research. And that led to the Talented Tenth. Now, having said that, you talk about the reproduction of the black bourgeoisie, I would say that that book, which is done 96, or like over 20 years ago, right? That was part of my liberal phase. I, I go through phases. Um, <laughs> but that would have been really progressive for me at the time, having been trained by Jesuits, right? And also growing up in a military family in Texas, having been in the ROTC, having shot weapons. So the whole notion of warfare is not foreign to me because my father was an officer in Vietnam. I mean, I grew up with that. But I do understand that people who are not used to levels of violence tied to the employment sector of your parent might find a discussion of war and violence to be dis unsettling. It is not for cop kids and it's not for kids in the military. So in a way, they're already emotionally conditioned to theorize on this level 
which is, as I'm going to make a gamble and argue, is prohibited, during, prohibited by most conventional scholarship and theory. You don't explore violence, you don't analyze it, but people who are employed in that industry talk about it all the time. We, and we're trained in it, right? And so Mitchell, as a black communist woman, right, my background as I grew up in conservative Texas, um, all kind of came together when I looked at the talented tip. And then it's a bourgeois endeavor, a middle class endeavor, inclusive endeavor, whatever you want to call it, because I was trying to do a recovery act. Like, we don't talk about these folks, so we need to start thinking about it. And it was a corrective in some ways that if black feminism was talking about individuals but not linking them to SNCC, then, you know, or not linking them to radical politics, then I wanted to include that in transcending the talent to 10th. Mm. But then decades on, I see that we have, a, you know, this is all fungible or it's flexible. Like, you know, the state, and I consider the academy to be either, if it's private, it's a corporation. If it's public, it's an extension of uh, government. It has the adaptability to adjust. So it can accumulate more data on subjects, but still not comprehensively or thoroughly critique the radical or revolutionary thought of the subjects. They, in fact, appear on page, but they become isolated from traditions, hmm. particularly from cadre. So the Talented Tenth had those exemplary individuals, and now today I wouldn't, I wouldn't do a book like that, right? But I would say today, based on what I want to do, I couldn't get a job. So as long as I was following the, I'm not saying you, I mean, you all get jobs to worry about, but I'm thinking about the template in which these stellar individuals who follow a traditional line, even if it's disruptive, that leads to a traditional predictable outcome, which is always a victory for democracy. I do not think that democracy is victorious in terms of human rights or civil rights. I think that it's become, at least in the U.S. expression, another form of accumulation. Now, how, what I would talk about Marx and others, I, I can give you one concrete example because I think that's an, a complicated conversation. I don't think I'm well versed in it in the moment. I would say Kali Okuno's work on Cooperation Jackson, which looks at, um, it's a black formation. Some of their cubs, some of them are panther cubs, right? meaning children of the Black Panther Party or their black activists who've created this um, economy in Jackson, Mississippi, based on the previous mayor, where they've been able to accumulate property, land, grocery stores, like trying to rethink economies of autonomy, but also to present a model um, for going forward. So it's sort of separating from the state without reproducing it and without necessarily pledging allegiance to it. One last note I would say is, as I said before when I was here in the spring, I concur with Kathleen Cleaver's analysis that black people are told to present a united front. Um, we don't have a united front, that we're split not just by class but also by ideology, and that you know black elites basically dominate the discourse, but their dominance seems to be much in alignment of POTUS 44 like, you know, sort of claiming victories of hope that may not necessarily materialize on the ground. Hello, um, thank you all so much. Um, it's really wonderful to hear from each of you. Um, I kind of wanted to ask about one very, very small piece, um, Professor James, that you brought up, which was, um, and I, I know we're not necessarily talking about Greta Thunberg today, but her talking about how ASD is kind of a superpower and you mm -hmm. briefly kind of meditated on the question of whether trauma can be a, a superpower or perhaps um, something that can be utilized. And um, I am right now because of where I'm situated, I'm always kind of thinking through the lens of the child welfare system, particularly in New York City. Mm -hmm. and. Um, it made me think about the way that a lot of people's problem, uh, trauma, um, particularly poor black and brown folks, are weaponized by the state against them. So a, a young mother who um, 
and and for me, always um, always thinking kind of from the point of that poverty is is conflated, uh, neglect is conflated with poverty, and po poverty is conflated with neglect in that system. How you know someone's past trauma is then weaponized against them by the state, and the state insisting that they're going to take away their child unless they do. Um, a million mental health services, and unless they're medicated, and so weaponizing someone's trauma against them, um, and kind of taking away that if if it is a superpower, if it is a tool, um, taking it away from them, and then weaponizing it against them. Um, so using that to medicate, to surveil, to control, and it kind of brings for me the question of if there are tools, if there are powers, um, how it gets it's. It is subject to the predation of democracy, and um, what are the ways in which folks can then reclaim it back or have it not happen in the first place? Yeah, I think it's complicated, right, because I spoke about Deborah Danner, and then um, based on the information I have, she was not on her medication when she was shot. So, I mean, some people will blame Danner for that. Like, if you'd only taken your meds for schizophrenia, your neighbors wouldn't have called the police because you were having a manic episode and screaming. And if you had been balanced enough, and she writes in that article, I mean, she, she worries about being killed by the police because um, Eleanor Bumpers, who is also an elderly black woman, had been killed by the police um, in her bathrobe, in her home, like in the 1980s. And she was writing, I don't want to go out the way Eleanor Bumper did. And so in some ways, this is shaming of people who have medical needs. Um, and then a demand that they provide self-care for themselves, even if the healthcare system or the medical system is subpar. But then add on to it that they're to be regulated as proto-criminals or as those who would be likely. I mean, I don't have the stats in front of me, but disproportionately, when the police are shooting, um, you know, discharging their firearms, they tend to be um, more aggressive with people who can't follow their commands promptly. They're also aggressive if you do follow their commands promptly. So that's what I mean. It's like, it feels like a toss of the coin at time. But um, the police position is, we're not therapists or medical, you know, cadres. So why are you bothering us or calling us on these calls? And if you do, we're going to do what we're trained to do, right? Which and they are trained also, obviously, among other things, to use lethal force. I think. I think the I don't I don't even Ayami. I couldn't even say comprehensively what to do other than to scale back the services because they're not real services based on some of the organizing that I've seen, they're actually punitive. Mm. I know parents in, um, and I also saw this in other states, where if a principal or teacher wanted you out of school, they could just you know, write up a certain report or make an anonymous phone call, you know, that there's abuse at home or your child's so dysregulated. Um, District 79 in New York City, City is juvie, but District 75 is where they put the special needs kids. But that's a form of juvie too, if you've ever been inside a District 75 school and seen you know, kids crawling on the floor and barking and just being ignored because it's a, it's a container that they're disposable. So the best I come to is, is how you would merge a certain kind of practicality with a certain kind of vision which would be to take back, as I said earlier, the policing functions of the state. Like one example is from Chicago. Last month, the National Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression reconstituted itself after 46 years. So it was formed in 1973, a year after Angela's acquittal. And so it's essentially, they took the Free Angela Davis Committee and they after she was acquitted in June 72 and turned into the National Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression. But the cases they picked up were much more manageable, so to say, because the people were tied to, I make the distinction, people say you shouldn't, between social and political prisoners, but they were more tied to the social. So Joanne Little would be one case, right? So a black woman who's raped by a prison guard, right, in the early 1970s, who stabbed the prison guard, he died. She disappeared, but was brought to trial. She actually, Angela writes an article on her for Ms. Magazine. If you think of Joanne Little, 
and you look at her case history, she would have been in either foster care or some kind of therapeutic care based on what she'd been doing since she was an early teen, right? But those interventions rarely happen and they rarely happen well. But when the National Alliance is formed, this is what they try to do, and I hope it goes to the point. They're taking what they're arguing is the precarity and vulnerability of people at risk with the state, and they're partnering it with political prisoners. So they're trying to close the gap, and they're saying the issue now is to fight. That was the refrain over and over again. They didn't say negotiate. They didn't say mediate. They're electing aldermen in Chicago to put forward um, a control of police. After they get control of the police, which is their mission, they've got 14 progressive aldermen. They want control of the mayor. They don't care the mayor is the first black lesbian. They still see the same outcomes. After they get control of the mayor, they're going for the governor. They're going for the president. And that's what I was trying to say about the POTUSes. Unless you control the executive branches that authorize the use of force, you cannot control your reality and the level of trauma and dispossession in your lives or the taking or removal of your children. You have to track the violence and see who gets to authorize it. And then you need to create a path towards whoever can legally authorize the level of violence in your lives. Most people or most institutions seek remedy and repair. They do not seek a confrontation with the authoritative executive permission for violence. And maybe it's my military like chain of command thing, but it's the person who says sh you can shoot with impunity, like the POTUS, I could shoot somebody on Fifth Avenue and still walk away with it. That's the person that you eventually want to influence and corral. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, and thank you to our panelists and to those who participated in the conversation. I know that we have some students who need to get back to their classroom, and we also have another panel coming up. Um, but this conversation can and must continue. So for those who want to, I mean, not in this structure, but in our lives. <laughs> um, so who, for those who want to, um, please feel free to talk to the panelists, with the exception of Drea, but she's here at the CSSJ on Tuesdays and Thursdays um, and doing awesome work that she spoke about in the previous panel. So we're all around. So thank you so much. So.